Hi, this is Katie DeSalle, and I am with Minnesota Capital News, and I'm here with Tom Hoke, who is running for mayor of Minneapolis this election. Hi, Tom. Hi, great to be here. Thanks for being here. Can you start off by giving us some of your background? I know you grew up in Minneapolis with a lot of siblings. Yes. Um, uh, tell, tell us more from that. Sure. So I am a, a Minneapolis kid. I, did, I grew up in Minneapolis. I was born here, and I am the fifth oldest of 11. And uh, I'm actually an identical twin. Most people don't know that. Yeah, so I have a twin brother running around, and he doesn't look exactly like me, so I can't really get away with being two places at one time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to uh, Washburn High School. I then uh, graduated from high school and went to college. Uh, uh, after college, I taught for Minneapolis Public Schools as an elementary school teacher. So I've taught second through sixth grade. And uh, following a few years of teaching, I put myself through law school. After law school, I practiced for a few years, but I was always really interested in the city and city building and how that comes together. And so I uh, went to work for the city of Minneapolis and started doing real estate development for the city. Uh, in that capacity, LaSalle Plaza and the State Theater was one of my projects. So for um, your listeners, they may not know that the State Theater was really the watershed case for historic preservation in Minneapolis. And uh, I was charged with with preserving that facility, seeing it got restored, and, and, in, and integrating it into the larger LaSalle Plaza project, the office tower, and then there's the old YMCA on the back side of it. So I uh, got that done. I got the theater up and running. Uh, just before uh, the State Theater opened, Bob Dylan, the Bob Dylan, decided to uh, sell the Orpheum Theater, so I handled the acquisition of that and uh, got it up and running. Uh, and then turned my attention to the Public Housing Authority where I became the Deputy Executive Director. So at the time that I went to the Housing Authority, it was uh, in dire straits. Uh, HUD was getting ready to take it over. It had a lot of problems faltering, uh, I say, and uh, over a course of six years, we were able to write the Housing Authority and uh, get a uh, high performer designation from HUD, which is a designation that is the highest HUD will give and it is one that the Housing Authority continues to have today. While I was there, I had the opportunity to uh, explore a number of really exciting projects, one of which was uh, resolving litigation known as the Holman litigation, and I uh, negotiated the financial terms of that uh, settlement in that case, the Holman settlement, uh, which brought $100 million to the city of Minneapolis. and. Uh, provided the funds to improve the housing on the near north side and create a new mixed income community as well as foster a more robust uh, metropolitan wide program for individuals using their housing assistance. Mm -hmm. I also uh, went to Congress and uh, uh, secured a change in the law at Congress that uh, permitted uh, housing authorities to designate some of their high rises for seniors only so that we could enable seniors to stay in their homes for a longer period of time because we could better target the social services that they would need to individual buildings. Uh, we were the first in the country to do that and today uh, virtually every housing authority in the country is able to make that kind of designation and to improve the lives of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of seniors across the country today. I finally uh, well, had the opportunity to oversee the rehabilitation of virtually every high-rise in the city. There are 42 uh, public housing high-rises, and that was a thrilling and uh, challenging uh, encounter, but uh, our housing uh, authority uh, rose to the challenge, and we got them all rehabbed. They all are in need of rehab again today because it's been 20, 25 years later. So what was the most challenging thing about that? I think balancing the needs and, and desire to provide the best possible housing with the available resources. And that's always the case. You know, it's a resource-driven kind of thing, and we're trying to balance, uh, you know, where do we, what do we absolutely have to do, and where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? So if elected mayor, where would you <clears throat> find those resources? On the affordable housing front, uh, what I have said is that uh, we need to ensure that the Public Housing Authority has the funds it needs to uh, handle the capital improvements that it hasn't been able to handle since I was there. And it's about $127 million in arrears. This is part of a national phenomenon. 
Uh, not many people know that public housing authorities across the country are about six million dollars behind in the capital improvements that they need. And this is big building systems like plumbing systems, electrical systems, building envelopes, windows, you know, facades, roofs, elevators, those kinds of things that really, if they're not taken care of, make a building uninhabitable. So in Minneapolis, it's about $127 million. The first thing I would do is work with housing authorities around the state and, frankly, around the country working with mayors to ensure that the federal government understands the situation right now because it was the federal government's promise to cities and to housing authorities that this housing would be permanently affordable. And the federal government has reneged on that promise across administrations, and we need to get the federal government back to the table to ensure that we are addressing the needs of housing authorities because ho public housing, certainly in Minneapolis, provides you know um, deep subsidy, affordable housing for thousands of people, low-income, elderly, and disabled people. So first we'll start bringing mayors to the table uh, to make this happen, and if we are not successful at the federal level, we're going to have to uh, work with those individuals. There are housing authorities across the state, so work with individuals across the state to get the state government to step in and help us. Do you have any plans to um, house the homeless population? How would you deal with that? Yeah, well, uh, homelessness is, you know, there is a, we look at the arc of housing, and homelessness uh, is, is not the same as affordable housing. So we want to make that really clear, because shelter housing is not, is not house, housing as we tend to think of it. It is really a stopgap kind of measure. The best thing we can do going forward is to ensure that individuals don't become homeless in the first place, because once that happens, there's a whole cascade of other uh, issues that tend to arise. So that's the first thing we can do, and that means, you know, making sure that we have equitable education, that we have good paying jobs for everyone in our community, that we have stable stable families and good education. Those, so th we really need to make sure that those are in place. For those individuals who find themselves uh, in a homes, uh, without a home, we need to move them rapidly through the shelter system and do everything we can to ensure that they have affordable housing. And permanent housing is key. Having affordable housing, having a roof over your head, safe, sanitary, clean housing is fundamental to an individual's ability to prosper in our community. What would you do to create jobs in Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So uh, many people today will say that, well, we have plenty of jobs and we just haven't linked up you know, everyone with those jobs. I agree uh, with that in some respects, but focusing on the present is not a substitute for focusing on the future. And as mayor, you need to be able to multitask and you need to be doing both. So currently, we need to make sure that we have great pathways into the existing jobs that we have in our community. But going forward, we really need to be intentional about the kinds of jobs that we want to create in our community. Now, when we look around at other cities, they have plans for their economic vitality. And unfortunately, we don't have one in Minneapolis. So we, without a plan, we will just get the future we get as opposed to get the future we want. So we can actually empower ourselves to design the future we really want. And as it relates to jobs, there are three areas where I would really take a hard look, and I would look at food and what we could do around food. We have, you know, we have a mill district in Minneapolis. We, we have a history of being you know, the breadbasket of the country. We could be the breadbasket of the world in many respects, where there's going to be 9.8 billion people in this world in the next decade, and they're all going to have to eat. So that's a huge opportunity for us. So there's a lot that we could do there, all the way from, you know, supporting the new food uh, entrepreneur all the way to the uh, feeding into the larger uh, uh, food production uh, consumer goods companies that we have right now and making sure that they're successful. So it's a big silo and we can bring all of our resources to bear on that and really grow that area. Another area where we could do a really good job is in health and wellness. You know, that whole area is changing. The way that that medical care is going to be delivered is really up in the air right now. All the conversation in Washington is just underscoring how much is up in the air. And so we could really be training and identifying the, the kinds of jobs and the training that we need to really grow that sector here and become a magnet around the country. And finally, arts and culture. Now, I know a lot about that. And 
you know, I can tell you this. We could be so much better by simply aligning our resources around our arts and culture, and you bring to the table education and labor and nonprofit and for-profit and businesses, and we will really soar. We need a bigger footprint for arts and culture in this state because not only will we grow our arts economy when we do that and grow the good jobs within it, but we will attract the kinds of resources that want to be by that because I will tell you nothing is truer than that, that capital follows culture, and we will attract the kind of capital we want if we can grow our culture. Do you have a spe spe specific example of how you're going to... Uh, make the arts and culture uh, more popular here? Yeah, that's a really good idea. You know, sometimes I, I have very, uh, s very specific ideas like, you know, we should, we have book clubs, we should really have a, month, a once a month for theater club as one example where everyone, just as, as a part of being here, Everyone goes to theater once a month. So you go to a dinner party and people talk about what they just saw at the theater. I mean, that's just one, one way to do that. There's another way that we could approach it as well. And several years ago, I, I went to the National Endowment for the Arts and received a planning grant to create a cultural district that runs from the Mississippi Riverfront to the Walker Arts Center and from Nicollet Mall over to First. And we, it's a cultural district. So we spent about 18 months, and it, this was artist-led, by the way, but 18 months figuring out how we could really make this area um, really come alive because currently there are some 56 arts organizations on and around Hennepin Avenue right now. Most people don't know that, but how could we bring all of that to life? How could we use arts as a connective tissue from the Walker Art Center all the way to the Mississippi Riverfront? So that's one thing we could do. It is now called, we do, it has a brand, the West Downtown Cultural District. So bringing that to life gives us instantly a huge footprint. And we've already done the groundwork on it, by the way, so it's all set to go. But that gives us a huge footprint such that now around the country people begin to look and say, oh, I'm going to, we do, in Minneapolis. You know, it's like the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust and what they have done, only this is going to be bigger and it's going to be better. And it's, it's really organic to who we are. We really are arts people. So if we want to continue that vibe, we need to make sure that we provide opportunities for artists to make a living as artists, and this cultural district will help us do that. And by the way, once individuals are coming here, then we can begin to branch out to the Northeast Arts District and to all of the other cultural hubs that we have around the city. So it really is, is you know, sort of ground zero for arts and culture, but then once we get people here, we can take them all over our city. Great. Do you have any ideas on how to get more <clears throat> arts and music involved in schools? Because I know a lot of budgets are mm -hmm. cutting those programs, which would be very important for, for your plan to have those in schools. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I think that <clears throat> in terms of more arts and culture in, in the schools, is it's a matter of will. Do we want that to happen? Because, and it isn't, by the way, that, that, all, that schools have to have replicate or, or create all of that. We have great arts organizations right here. And you know, I'm a big proponent of pulling down the walls of schools and having kids out in the community and using the community resources to teach them. I think that is much more efficient. It reinforces the identity and the success of organizations out in the community. So I would really just take down those walls and start really being intentional about, intentional about making alliances with arts organizations in the community. And they all offer education programs. I know I did when I was at Hennepin Theater Trust. We had a spotlight musical theater program that served 88 high schools across Minnesota. So all of these big arts organizations, and even the smaller ones, are running programs that are very suitable to um, an interface with, with uh, grade school and high school kids. During your time <clears throat> as a teacher in Minneapolis Public yeah. Schools, what was something that you found really frustrating that you thought, man, I wish I could do something about this. I wish I could change this. Yeah, I think uh, probably one of the most challenging things was when kids came from unstable homes. They were, they were unstable for a variety of reasons. Sometimes there was it was poverty. Sometimes it was it was um, you know it might have been alcoholism. Sometimes it was just strife, trauma within that family. And kids, you know, they bring to school the environment that they live in. And so as a teacher, uh, not only did I not like seeing the trauma and wishing I could do more about it, but it gets in the way of kids' success academically. And so that was, you know, what I have said is that as the mayor of Minneapolis, I will do everything in my power because I'm the only teacher in the race, and I understand, you know, how important it is for kids to show up ready to learn. 
that um, I would do everything in my power to make sure that kids show up uh, ready, ready for school in, at age five, at kindergarten, because we need them to be successful right from the beginning. Kids are smart. They figure it out. They're intuitive beings, and they figure out whether what track they're on right away. And if, if we haven't set them up for success, it's a long haul to 12th grade, and it's not a surprise that they fall away before they get there. So are you proposing like uh, all-day pre-K? I'm absolutely in favor of all-day pre-K. I think we need to get kids as early as we can. Some, you know, the brain science would suggest we need them by age three if we really want to make a difference. And I, th I think we want all kids, you know, participating in this. Um, some individuals suggest it needs to be even sooner than that. But let's aim for by age three, we have, have kids, you know, in a program that is making sure that they're getting the nutrition they need, that they're getting stimulated, and that they are on the road to success. So if they're three years old, it would be a, like a pre-pre-K yeah, yeah, situation. Yeah. Uh, what, well, where we, have, we have, you know, and it's, I mean, it's not a bad idea. It's, I mean, it could be a different kind of child care, sure, okay. you know, that is really more, more focused on getting kids ready for school. Okay. Where, where would the funds for that come from? Well, you know, I mean, I said, you know, we, there, we have to create the will to do that. And I am not, I mean, I am as conscious as anyone about the burden on our taxpayers. But we have to get more people at the table because the reality is is that when we don't take care of this, we pay for it anyway. And in fact, it's way more expensive to delay it. So we just have to, you know, is there a slight uptick to get going? Yes, but I will, I, every study will tell you that money spent early is money well spent. What would you do uh, if elected about uh, police transparency and criminal justice reform? Really good questions, and I know that in our community there is, there is a lot of open debate about the police department. So what I have said I will do is uh, a top to bottom review right away of the police department and be transparent about it. I think one of the things that works against the police um, is when the public does not have trust and confidence in them. And so when I talk about an open and transparent review, I see it to everyone's benefit. The police department. Uh, uh, staff as well as the general public because once we we restore uh, pu uh, confidence by the public and the police department the police will feel better about the job they need to do so that's the first thing I would do I think as part of that review we need to examine the kind of um, civilian oversight of the police department I think the, there is a consensus out there that it isn't everything that we want it to. And it is part of building confidence in, in the public that the police are accountable to the people they are charged with serving. So it might be, you know, what all the way to, um, you know, what kind of, do we have police officers in the review process or is it simply civilians? Is there subpoena power or not? And we would have to take a hard look at that and see if those things need to be changed. I know for one thing that uh, when we think about investigating police officers for um, alleged misconduct, that the quality of the investigation is paramount. It must be a very thorough and professionally done uh, investigation or we cannot have confidence in the outcome. What would you do working with the people to restore their trust in the police? Mm -hmm. Well, there are several things I would do. Uh, first of all, I would be out talking with people. I don't think it's enough to sit at, sit at City Hall and communicate through a microphone. I think, I think particularly in this time, the, the uh, public wants to see the mayor out there. When I think about public safety, here's what I think about. I want everyone in our city to live in a safe neighborhood. And here's how I would do that. I would first of all listen. I would go out and listen across the city to what people are saying. And I'm going to be driven by, an out, by outcomes that I want to see. So I want to, I want to know that at least 90% of individuals in every neighborhood feel that their neighborhood is safe, and at least 90% of individuals have a high degree of confidence in the professionalism of the Minneapolis Police Department. And I would survey people annually in our city to find out how they feel. So what that means is that I'm looking at the outcome. What is the outcome? And the outcome is the same regardless of where you live, whether you live in southwest Minneapolis, you live on the east side, whether you're north or near north. Okay. The outcome is the same. 
the strategies that we use in order to get there may be very different. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you this, these are strategies that have to be developed with and supported by the community in each instance. So let's <coughs> say a survey comes back, 75% of the people don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. uh, what would, how would you create like a community or groups uh, of, of safetyness around these people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So first of all, we know that we have to engage the community because plans that are imposed on communities never work. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, there's no ownership. So we have to do the hard work of growing support for the strategies that are developed. My job as mayor is to hire the best person I can find to be the chief of police and to ensure that the chief of police is making inroads in terms of moving the dial on those percentages and ensuring that the chief of police and the mayor are, the chief of police and the community are working together on those things. So, I mean, that's, that's where the mayor comes in. That's the supervision of the police chief, ensuring that the police chief is doing his or her job. <clears throat> I, uh, on your website, I read that you are in favor of the decriminalization of marijuana possession. Are yes. you in favor <clears throat> of um, legalizing recreational marijuana use here? Yes. Why are you in favor right. of that? Good question. Well, because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> because there, there are several reasons. One, because marijuana is being widely used anyway, and it, you know, it, you know, when we've looked at what other states have done, you know, they haven't had the, you know, this litany of, you know, uh, a, you know, imagined problems that have come up, and it's actually been a good revenue raising potential. So, if you want to talk about how we're going to pay for early childhood education, or we're going to create more affordable housing, let's be creative and think about how could we create some additional revenue streams. And recreational marijuana. Uh, seems to me to be just one of those that we could do. The other thing is that right now we have laws that are inequitably enforced. So if you're, uh, if you're an indigenous or man or a, a person of color, you know, you're six to nine times more likely to be arrested for minor infractions like smoking marijuana. So there's a whole equity component to this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, I look at this and I'm like, why are we doing this? Because by and large, you know, the majority of the public supports the legalization marijuana. So what is holding us back from adhering to those, those wishes? What do you think is holding us back? Uh, I think the political will, I guess, and I, I don't really understand that. Now, I'm not really a politician, so maybe I just have a lot to learn, but I'm saying it here that I think that the um, legalization of marijuana, you know, is something that we should look at seriously and move ahead with. What would you say to those people who, those critics who would say you don't have any political experience? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have any political experience sitting in the seat of mayor, but I do have a lot of experience running the historic theaters in downtown Minneapolis. I have a lot of experience running the city's public housing authority. I have a lot of experience doing real estate development on, the, on behalf of the city of Minneapolis, and all of those things have required to me to operate in a political environment. I have been the chair of the Minneapolis Downtown Council. I'm a founder of the uh, Downtown Improvement District. All of those things required significant and and successful interaction with the city and its political structure. So while I might not be a politician, I understand the political system very, very well. Who do you think your biggest opponent is this election? That's a good, you know, that's a good question. I think, I think uh, my biggest opponent is, um, is a lack of substance by the other candidates. I think that individuals who continue to, um, to um, position themselves as those who simply need more time or individuals who have been in, the, in positions of authority and have not made change and promise now to do more is a threat to our future vitality of the city because these are individuals who actually don't need more time. Time is up, and we need to get moving on making our city the best place it can be. Can you name an, an opponent that you, uh, something that you agree with them on, that you admire? What I can say is that all of the individuals who are running, you know, I'd like to believe are doing this because they love the city of Minneapolis, and they want the best for it. When did you decide to run for mayor? In, uh, I really decided uh, in February. Okay of this year and stepped away from my job as a, 
CEO of Hennepin Theater Trust. Okay. So good job. You you like doing what you do. Why decide you want to run for mayor? What what like deep down in your heart are you really want to be a Minneapolis mayor? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I've spent as I've, you've heard me describe my background, I've spent my entire adult life trying to make Minneapolis just the best place it can be. And you know, watching it over the past few years, I was convinced that we were not on the right path and that I had a lot to offer. I, you know, I am you know, a guy who works hard. I show up every day, try to make our city better. I'm not anxious to parlay this into anything other than just being the best mayor I can be. I don't want to be governor, I don't want to be senator, I don't want to be a congressman, I'm not looking for anything other than to show up every day and serve the people of Minneapolis the best way I can. And I, this is a great way to do it, I think. Thank you. Um, right. Anything else you'd like to add? No, no, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about you know, my ideas and I thought your questions were really, really good ones. And uh, you know, my website is Tom from Minneapolis, uh, spelled out com. And people want to know more about me, they can go ahead and go there. Right. Thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is Katie DeSalle with Minnesota Capital News here with Tom Hoke running for Minneapolis mayor. We'll see you next time.